Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, you won't believe it, but for the last two days, we've been stressed beyond belief about whether there'd be enough food for you at lunch. Um, clearly, I think there was a ton of food out there, and you've all fed very well. And our challenge this afternoon is to make for, sure you don't fall asleep with all that food in your stomach. So as you're settling in, I just wanted to, uh, you've seen the slides there, and we've got a great panel coming up. Um, Today's moderator, uh, the session's moderator, is Richard Harris. Uh, Richard, uh, as I think most of you know, is a reporter for NPR. Um, I, I listen to his uh, stories, his uh, reports very regularly on my commute, evening and afternoon, and he's, as I've watched a lot of his reports on the spill. In fact, uh, I think he was maybe the first or one of the first to, to really start digging into the story about whether the initial reports, I think it was, uh, was it 2,000 barrels a day or whatever it was, was a gross uh, underestimate and the flow coming out was much, much higher. That's uh, an example of, uh, of Richard's uh, great reporting. Um, I also wanted to, while people are selling, to sort of tell a little story here. He, he's, he's also a really decent human being. Um, and he, he kind of caught me interesting. Uh, about nine years ago, I was at the uh, Johannesburg summit. It was the Rio plus 10. And you know, we're getting in Rio plus 20 next year. And I happened to be in the press room doing some uh, emailing back to my family or something. And Richard was doing a story about carbon offsets. And he happened to see me there at the computer. And he came over. He said, oh, can you help me with the story? And of course, the media come up, and you want to be on a story? You say, sure. So it ended up, this story was, was I going to pay 60 or $70 for my carbon offset for my flight? And of course, when the microphone's in front of you, you say, of course, of course. You grab it, the card, and you pay for it. And so that was the end of the story. And about a week later, I got an email from the carbon offset company that said, Richard Harris just paid his carbon offset too, not paid for by Empire, paid out of his own pocket, and there was a moment something to the effect of, thanks for being a good sport, Pete. So uh, thank you, Richard. I've remembered that ever since. Uh, and, and, and then we have to do carbon offsets whenever we travel, and hopefully many of you did that when you came to the conference. So on that note, um, let me now turn the, uh, the microphone over to Richard and another great session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I walked over here so I didn't have to pay a carbon offset to get here today. So that was a big relief. So anyway, welcome everybody. Uh, we'll keep this lively this afternoon since you've all had a little bit of food in your stomach, and I know that it's a good, a good challenge to stay awake, but I've been chatting with these guys at lunch, and, and we are going to keep you awake, I promise. So let me make a couple of really quick introductions, and then we're going to just plunge into a, a conversation here that will take about an hour. So uh, immediately to my right is David Yaskowitz, who is uh, basically an economist, socioeconomics, is that right, at, uh, at Texas A&M, and I will be uh, throwing questions to him about about the economic and social human impact of, of the spill. Uh, to his uh, left is Pete Peterson, who is a professor at uh, University of North Carolina, and he is, his claim to fame is following the uh, Exxon Valdez spill for low these many years, and uh, and 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 one and it's obviously really interesting to compare what happened in 1989 up in Prince William Sound to what happened in the Gulf of Mexico last year. So we will. Uh, uh, I will turn to him for those questions. To his left is Ed Overton, who's an emeritus professor, although he's been working full time, uh, emeritus in, in quotes for sure, at uh, Louisiana State University studying the coastal environmental issues and so on. And uh, last but not least is Wes uh, Tunnel, at the, uh, who's also at Texas A&M. And uh, he actually will bring us back to another huge spill in the Gulf of Mexico, Ixtoc 1 in 1979. So. Uh, uh, also, very important lessons to learn from that as well. And um, uh, I, I guess I, I want to throw my first question to Ed and say, okay, uh, people aren't talking about oil anymore. Is it gone? What, 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 what actually did happen to all that stuff that got spilled? 4.1 million barrels, probably, uh, plus another 800,000 that they managed to capture and bring ashore. Where'd it go? Do we still have to worry about it? Next question. <laughs> <laughs> You're not well, getting off that easy. 
of course, this is, this is, we're not yet a year out from the spill. It's been six months since the oil stopped going into the Gulf. And so there's a lot of debate on just uh, where the oil is. But it looks like maybe uh, two thirds of the oil was dispersed naturally and with chemicals at depth. Only maybe a third of the oil got to the surface, last estimates I'm hearing. Uh, the oil is eminently biodegradable. It is certainly being degraded very rapidly. Oil that reached the shoreline, in the, particularly in the marshy shoreline, is still on the shoreline. Uh, I've heard some numbers like something on the order of 10,000 miles of, of marshy coastline were in harm's way from this spill. Uh, something like 600 receives oiling, 100 to 150 heavily oiled. And those areas that were heavily oiled certainly are still heavily oiled today. Along the uh, northern Gulf Panhandle, we're seeing tar balls. At the, we went from heavily oiling during the summer when the active oil was coming into the Gulf to uh, mostly tar balls. There's oil that's been incorporated down into the, the uh, sandy sediments. Uh, it's tar mats. These things are breaking off. So you clean up tar balls, and the next day you go back, you clean up more tar balls, which is pretty... Uh, pretty uh, similar to most oil spills. It's going to take a while. Hopefully, as we go, the, the amount of tar balls will be less. How quickly and how much oil is on the shoreline is another issue. Uh, you can't get into the marshy shorelines to do much remediation, so we basically have to let Mother Nature handle it. And two-thirds under the, under the surface of the water, Those, is it still oil or what is it now? Well, it, it was dis remember, dispersed oil means that the droplets, the, in order to stay down at those depths, the, the, the droplet size needs to be something on the order of the diameter of a human hair or less. So 100 microns to 10 microns. So oil that's that small in diameter has an infinite rise time to the surface. Another way of saying that is it stays at depth. It disperses. Of course, it's got lots of surface area. It's being degraded by bacteria in the deep guff. Uh, remember, the guff is an acclimated body to oil 20 to 40 million gallons a year uh, are estimated to seep into the guff. So you've got a, a highly acclimated body of water. And so it, it looks like uh, as you get beyond the wellhead, uh, something on the order of 10 to 20 kilometers, you lose the signal. So we, we, that current analytical capability doesn't seem to be able to track it much beyond 20 kilometers. Is that because we didn't do a really good job of tracking it when it started to move away, or just because it's diluted to such an extent that you can't track it anyway? Well, I, th I think right now, of course, there's lots of studies that are going to be ongoing, but, but right now we're below the detection limits. Uh, in, in the detection limits, for large quantities of water are in the part per, low part per billion, part per trillion range. So we've lost the ability to detect it. Massive dilution, massive biodegradation, the oil that came ashore, there's no more oil floating offshore. There is stranded oil on the sandy beaches, and there's uh, uh, stranded oil on some heavily impacted areas, notably in the Louisiana Delta. Hmm. So, Wes, you, 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 this is a, a, a rerun of a movie that you saw in 1979, right? The uh, Ixtoc One oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, a shallower well, as I recall, but spilled for a longer period of time, a little bit less oil in total, but that was in some ways the baseline spill, if you want to put it, uh, un un unfortunately, I guess, for the Gulf. What, ha what, what happened there? What happened to the oil out of Ixtoc One? Yeah, that's, that's really the spill that we should be comparing to. Uh, before I get into that, I'd I'd correct that uh, David and I are from Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. There's actually 10 Texas A&M universities in Texas, so we have to clarify that. Yeah, the president and, would be and, happy that you said that. And my executive director University. is here from the Heart Research Institute, so we have to say we're from that too. So much advertising. Uh, yes, uh, the Ixtoc spill occurred about 50 miles offshore, the same, but only in about 160, 70 feet of water. Uh, it was in the very southern Gulf of Mexico. It was 140 million gallons of oil, and it spewed for almost 10 months. The difference being, of course, that the Deepwater Horizon kind of hung around in that calm time of the year, which was a good thing, except when the storms came through. And the uh, Eekstock spill uh, moved forward slowly with the currents until it reached Texas uh, in August and September of 1979. But then the norther started coming and some tropical storms came. And so the Deepwater Horizon spill covered maybe 400 miles of linear shoreline, not counting all the indentations. And the Ixtoc spill covered about 1,500 miles of shoreline. So a huge area of the southern Gulf was covered by all the shorelines. And so, so what happened to that oil? How long did you see it or do you, you still see it? 
Yes, uh, I was a, a young scientist back then. Ed and I both had the opportunity to study then. And I was uh, aghast when I saw the oil coming our way from Mexico and then covering the Texas beaches, uh, about 170 miles of the Texas beaches, 20 to 30 yards in width, and a half an inch to a foot in thickness uh, on the Texas beaches in August of 1979. And so uh, I was aghast. I thought everything was going to die and be gone. Uh, and yet, uh, a couple of years later, it was hard for us to find anything. Uh, I monitored the sandy beaches from Texas all the way around the Yucatan in the summer of 80 and found some oil then, but a couple of years after that, could not find any. I was able to track it on the rocky shore areas where you can still find it today, just the asphalt end of it. That's why we use asphalt on our highways. It lasts a long time. I was also able to find it in the lagoon of a coral reef off Veracruz that I was taking a class to at the time, and so I repeatedly went there to study and just took the time to go measure this. And so when I went back last summer, out of much curiosity for lots of people, it, the tar mat that was on the leeward side of the island that used to be 60 or 70 yards in length and 5 to 10 yards in width and 12 to 15 inches in thickness was at that time last June when I went about 5 uh, yards in diameter and about 1 to 2 inches in thickness. So I don't think it was having much of an effect except to right where it was laying, but here 30 years later it was still there. The same on the rocky shores and the same on the mangrove areas north of Campeche. What about uh, coral reefs? Well, I think we were fortunate during that time when the oil was hanging offshore to the east of the 25 reefs off the city of Veracruz. It didn't come in until a tropical storm pushed it in, and that elevated with the storm surge, and so the oil, we think, was carried over the top of the reefs and only hit the islands. And, and most of the islands there, about 15 of them, were just wrapped uh, what looked like a black donut all the way around the island from 10 to 15 yards in width all the way around those islands. Yeah, and biological effects. Of course, seeing the oil is sort of disturbing for tourism and so on. We'll get to that in a minute with Dave. But what about biological effects of this? I mean, we heard so many early on, certainly in the, in the BP spill, we were hearing that this is a, a, an enormous environmental catastrophe. What, what lessons can you, can you draw from 1979 and tell us about what to expect? One of the biggest lessons is, is that continuing ongoing research was not done. And that's my biggest message for today is we need to keep doing it this time so we'll have the answers for the next time. Uh, as a personal example, I received a grant, several grants from NOAA to study the in-fauna the organisms that live in the beach uh, on Padre Island National Seashore. So we ran transects along the beach and out into the surf, and we were gonna have two to three years of funding was what was discussed. They gave us enough to do pre-spill samples and post-spill samples, and we saw an 80% reduction in intertidal organisms and 50% in subtitle. And so we thought we had a really nice design before and after. And then uh, the tropical storms of the mid-September of that year came along stirred up all the oil on the beach and reversed the currents as normally happens on the Texas coast. They usually run northward along the coast in the summertime and then turn southward with the first winter fronts. And word got back to Washington that the Texas beaches had been cleaned by the tropical storms and the oil went back to Mexico so they don't need any more funding. And my funding ended after six months. Uh, <laughs> well, I hope, I hope that story is not repeated this time around, because I think that's, I mean, we, I want to get to that a little bit later in the conversation, trying to understand what do we know, what don't we know, and, and is it possible still to plug some of those, those data gaps. Let me turn to Pete Peterson uh, for a minute and ask about um, the other dramatic spill in U.S. waters in Prince William Sound in 1989, 10 years later, the Exxon Valdez, a very different kind of spill all on the surface, a very different kind of environment, very cold. Uh, what, what tale of these two spills do you tell when people ask you to compare and contrast? Well, um, that tale I told for a week and then I stopped answering my phone. That <laughs> uh, was incredible how many people wanted to ask just that question, and that is, what did we learn from the Exxon Valdez oil spill?